Welcome to Medical Confessions, your remedy for serious medicine. I'm Jen. I'm April. And I'm Scott. Today we've got something a little different for you. We've teamed up with a wildly popular YouTube channel, Today I Found Out, and we're going to bring you the top five first aid tricks we think everyone should know. So the first question is, uh, the top five according to who? Well, between the three of us, we have over 40 years of emergency medical experience. So in our experience, these are the top five things we think everyone should know. And everyone should know, and it won't cost them an arm and a leg to be armed with it. So we always talk about equipment and supplies people need, but if you make it too difficult or too expensive, people aren't going to commit it. So these are things that people can take from us today and never have to spend any money on them. You don't need extended training. No. It's just quick. Well, and the, like, the other thing that always comes up with first, you know, everybody says, well, let's get a first aid kit. Well, no one carries a first aid kit no. around with them all the time. Well, and you really, know? you buy a first aid kit and they're horrible. There's like yeah. smelling salts <laughs> and some awesome scissors. You know, otherwise, it's kind of useless stuff, right? You're better off with duct tape and some rags. Yeah, duct maybe. tape, right? It's everything. <laughs> Why not? Super glue and duct tape. So. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and the biggest one is who carries anything around with them anyway? No you know, does. I mean... You, the one time you're going to need something, you're not going to have it, you know? Because you've emptied your trunk for Costco run. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? It's laying yeah. in your garage floor. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> when um, you've needed it? Well, like I, no. well, you know, like you guys know, I carry an AED typically with me just because I have a child that had a potential need for it. And there were a couple times where I was kind of like, oh, ooh, I dumped it off because, yeah, yeah, I was going to load something in the trunk and it was sitting on the garage floor. So same with the first aid kit. Yeah. Yeah, I used to have a big fancy first aid kit I bought. That thing was like $300 or whatever. And now I think it's in my garage somewhere in a box. I don't even know where that thing's at because everything in the first aid kit, we can MacGyver something together. You right. Know? Um, everything you use, I mean, there's something around the house that can double as that thing. Yeah. We should dig oh. it out, though, and get the ammonia inhalants because those are always fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Play with your friends while they're sleeping. That's right. Uh, those are in the those, yeah, those yeah. Are good. Too bad AEDs don't let us shock people, you know, just when we want to, because, you know, <laughs> your friend sleep, the first one who falls asleep at the party. <sighs> That's a little morbid. Anyways. <laughs> Did I take that too far? <laughs> a little far. <laughs> you can put, uh, you know, that game that everybody holds the, the, um, electrodes and then whoever's the first one to let go or first or the last what? one to there's a You're game like milking that a cow she's no yeah a cow right now. Every, <laughs> no there's a game that you put in the center and it's got this timer and as soon as the timer goes off you have to let go and if you don't let go fast enough you get shocked oh okay so like and, a dog shocking collar technology okay, or something I was thinking just, it's what? horrible it's oh, a really? horrible game Yes. Well, I, I was thinking, what games do you play? Russian roulette? I mean, do you, yeah. I mean, how do you much. put it? You just plug it into the light socket. Okay, hold on until you, <laughs> until you can't let you go. Put that in the hand of the person sleeping and that about come up. Great. All right. Back on target right. here. So the top five first aid tricks, what are they? Number five on our list is direct pressure. Direct pressure, obviously, talking about bleeding control, right? Um, when it comes to any sort of injury, um, there's a chance that you could cut something and you're bleeding i think that's uh, something that people do naturally too like i feel like it's one of those things like when you cut your finger or whatever it's that automatic like oh, oh you know yeah. you kind of grab it so. you don't yeah. even looking at it right right <laughs> well, yeah or in everybody's seen you know on tv the artery squirting well everybody know ah grab hold on to that thing right right, right. um it's very true bleeding control it's super important right there's only you know, an average female's got about five liters of blood in them. The average adult male has about six liters of blood. That's not a lot of blood. So, you know, um, once you get to about 30% of your blood volume, uh, you're unconscious once you've lost 30% of that. So um, bleeding control is super important, especially if it's a big artery or vein that's bleeding. Um, so uh, let's just talk about all the types of bleeding um, and then why direct pressure actually even works and why it's so simple um, and, you know, the fact that you don't really even have to push that hard. Um, so there's three types of uh, uh, blood vessels in your body. There's capillary, veins, and arterial. So there's three types of bleeding. Capillary bleeding, venous bleeding, and arterial bleeding. Um, capillary bleeding is going to be that oozing blood coming out of a skinned knee or an, an abrasion you get somewhere. Uh, some people call it road rash. Um, 
And you, you don't actually lose a lot of blood volume there, obviously. So um, really the biggest thing is going to be uh, if you're going to stop that bleeding, protect yourself, right? Um, so when it comes to direct pressure and you want to, to stop that bleeding, uh, make sure you get a barrier device. Uh, pair of gloves would be nice if you had them, but let's be honest, who carries a pair of gloves around with them all the time, you know? Maybe if you're a surgeon or something, but even yeah. then, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, uh, so nobody's really carrying gloves around them. Um, but so find something that uh, is plastic. Put that around your hand, or even if you don't have any plastic, just find some clothing or some sort of cloth Thick that you can layers. that you can layer yeah. it up. Yeah, and and basically protecting yourself from someone else's blood. Um, because there's obviously a lot of uh, communicable diseases out there, and no one wants to get, uh, you know, herpes from trying to, you know, <laughs> stop someone else's it's bleeding. The first, first one that everyone thinks of, herpes. <laughs> herpes. Well, that's a, in my head, I was going to say HIV, but everybody knows that. So Let's serious. go something yep, off the yep, wall. Yep. Let's go herpes. Herpes. Um, uh, anyways, um, so then there's the venous bleeding, right? A little bit more profuse. It oozes out. Um, it's a little bit darker than arterial blood, but... Let's be honest, unless you're both bleeding venous and arterial at you're the same time, do you really know? Right. Right. You know? So there's not a lot of pressure with venous bleeding, right? Um, let's just talk blood pressure in general. You know, the, the average person has a 120 over 80 blood pressure, and that's 120 millimeters of mercury. Uh, for, re for reference, one millimeter of mercury is 0 0.0193 PSI. Um, so uh, if your blood pressure is, say, 200 over 100, super high because uh, you've got arterial bleeding and you're pasting the walls with your blood volume, um, you're going to be a little scared, and so maybe your blood pressure is high. Even a blood pressure of 200, you really only need uh, 3.86 pounds per square inch to stop that bleeding. So that's not a lot of pounds per square inch. I mean, unless you're you know, a quadriplegic and you can't move your hands up to stop, even a small kid can put their hand in the, and squeeze. Um, you're laughing. I just like your examples. It's like way out there. Just... <laughs> you're just imagining Stephen Hawking trying yes. to stop blood. He's sitting there. Oh, oh God. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could help. <laughs> Quality impersonation there. <laughs> uh, Stephen Hawking. Mm, Love that guy. Right. Um, do you think he changes the voice on his computer from time to time just to mess with people? No. I think that's his signature move. Like that's The all same he's got. voice? Yeah. You yeah. don't think he would change the voice? No. It's like Darth Vader. you got to stick with what works. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. Why not? Oh, yeah. Um, do you, I'm going to digress too much. Let's get back on topic. Let's follow, follow our path here. So you can expect each heartbeat to uh, excrete about what two point four ounces of. Yeah. So. Um, oh, that seems like a lot. It is. It says seventy milliliters. Is is uh, yeah, you know I'm a metric guy, so um, milliliter seventy milliliters. And it I actually. I didn't know there was a type. <laughs> Apparently, he's a metric kind of guy. Remember in the seventies, the let's go metric, you know? Yeah. Uh, because it's just, easier. Like, we, and it, it almost worked, but he was metric. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I couldn't look past it. <laughs> who wants to do fractions all day? Let's just move the decimal point back and forth. That just seems easier. Yeah. Because one thirty second, what is that? That's Let's the medicine just... kind of thing too. Yeah. Let's just Anyways. move the decimal point over. It's easy math. I like easy math. <laughs> Forget <laughs> I said anything. <laughs> us in Australia, we're going strong <laughs> with uh, our system. Is anybody else besides us in Australia? I can't think of any off the top of my head. No. I think it's just us two holding on strong. Yeah. And why Australia? I don't know. Scott. <laughs> Aren't they British? I'm going to start reeling in here. <laughs> Sorry. I see you over there. This is the passion of Scott's, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like hard math, and fractions are hard. Um, so, yeah, 70 milliliters of blood. Um, so if we know that the average adult male has uh, six liters... Well, and every heartbeat pumps out 70 milliliters of blood um, within, and every, the average person, let's just say their heart rate's 100 beats a minute, well, in just over a minute, you are going to empty your entire blood volume all over the place if you're ble bleeding out of an artery. Um, now, let's be honest, not all arteries are large enough to allow that true blood volume. You're not going to get 70 milliliters with every arterial 
squirt of blood. So it's going to depend on the size of your artery. But even if, um, even if it's a small artery, it's still going to drain you pretty quick. Right. Um, you know, the vampires of the world will start coming out of the woodwork. You know, ah. um, <laughs> It's like a kid in a candy store, right? Right, I mean, right. geez, you see the blood, you want it. Well, and, the, and truly, an, uh, a small amount of blood looks bad when it's an arterial bleed. Like, it squirts and it sprays and it looks really bad. Because we've had a couple incidents where, you know, you go to somebody's house and it's, a, you know, some sort of a minor trauma. But just the right angle and just the right location can uh, it paint looks, the walls. It looks bad. It looks Murder brutal. Scene. Yeah. yeah. Um, like you're going into an episode of Saw. Yeah. Um, Anyways, but so yeah, 70 milliliters of blood is how much you're squirting out with every heartbeat. Um, so the more excited you are because you're injured, um, the quicker you're going to have blood loss, whether it's venous or capillary. But like we talked about, at the end of the day, um, you really only need three to four pounds per square inch to stop any type of bleeding. So it doesn't matter the type. If you're worried about blood loss, direct pressure. Now, nobody's going to have uh, any sort of device to measure how hard they're squeezing right. so what's the rule of thumb squeeze till the blood stops makes sense yeah. but you don't have to squeeze very hard i mean obviously if you're squeezing you know if it's a carotid artery and you're squeezing they're not, you know you're not going to squeeze so hard you're cutting off oxygen just enough to stop the bleeding or if you did then that solves a whole host of other problems <laughs> <laughs> they die yeah, simple <laughs> yeah. oh you got no problems anymore you're dead um, <laughs> <laughs> or you could just not do direct pressure and let them bleed out. There you go. And just look at them and go, how long do you think you have? <laughs> I mean. It's a really dark show. I it could is. help. I could help, but I'm Stephen Hawking in a wheelchair and I can't. So I'm just going to watch you slowly bleed to death. <laughs> so the third type of bleeding is obviously arterial bleeding. Um, and it's just like you see in the movies. It's squirting out like a garden hose, right? Um, and like we talked about, about 70 milliliters of blood gets squirted out with every heartbeat. Um, obviously, depending on the size of the artery, um, not artery, not all arteries are, you know, truly one square inch that all 70 milliliters are going to be squirting out. Um, but if somebody, say, has a carotid artery that's, you know, squirting, a carotid artery is pretty pretty uh you know big artery it's not as big as your aorta of course where um your aorta is going to be the the largest artery in your body um and so all of the blood volume all that 70 milliliters is coming out of that uh, into that aorta but even your carotid artery in your neck that's squirting at you um that's not uh, going to get 70 milliliters of blood but it's still a lot of blood it's going to drain you pretty fast um, so <laughs> the second the second you see that arterial bleeding, you probably should stop it because it's going to bleed you out within a minute or two. Um, and actually only about 30% of that blood volume, like we talked about, is all you need before you'll pass it out. So if you see somebody whose carotid artery is bleeding and, you know, you don't want them to survive, maybe you don't put direct <laughs> pressure on them. Maybe you just let them bleed out. <laughs> You'd save me. <laughs> <laughs> I would save you. But really all you need is about three to four pounds per square inch, and that's even going to stop the carotid artery from bleeding. Um, we should probably talk about tourniquet use, actually, right? Yeah. Because there is a small percentage of, of injuries that direct pressure won't work, and that's going to be the arm or leg in a meat grinder or... It just got, you got blown up by an IED in Iraq. Extreme you know? events. Well, it's funny that you mentioned tourniquets because I feel like I was talking to April uh, earlier about this and I feel like tourniquets are kind of like bell bottoms. Like they, you know, as far as uh, first aid, like teaching it, it's, they, they get popular for a while and then, oh gosh, no, they're the worst thing ever. And I like feel like, jeans. yes, exactly. <laughs> High top white Nikes, you know, just they're those things that, you know, people all of a sudden will say it's going to cause gangrene. They're, you know, like don't use them unless it's worst case scenario. But I feel like when you need a tourniquet, you know, you need a tourniquet and you should apply it and apply it quickly. Well, and that's, you know, there is a huge controversy about tourniquet use, and it isn't because it doesn't stop bleeding, it's because of the complications from the tourniquet use. And so, historically, um, they went out of favor because people were going straight to the tourniquets right. before they were trying other things like direct pressure. And, and proper direct pressure. A proper direct pressure, yes. correct. They, yeah. you know, um, and so, if you uh, cut off blood flow to an extremity, which is what you're trying to do with a tourniquet, there's so much bleeding, where do you put the direct pressure, you know? Your, your hands are only so big, if your whole arm's blown up, you're not able to do that, so you do need to stop that bleeding. 
Um, the problems started coming in when it was small bleeding or one simple artery bleeding and people were still using the tourniquets. Um, and so the purpose of a tourniquet is just that. Um, uh, you know, if the injury is to your hand, somewhere uh, towards the body, you put the tourniquet on and you cinch it down to cut off blood flow to the distal portions of that extremity. Um, if, uh, but, and since you are cutting off blood flow, you're cutting off blood flow to everything. Right. <laughs> so the rest of the, the uh, extremity that's not injured, um, now all of a sudden you're not getting any uh, blood flow at all, and the veins are, or the cells are starting to become more acidic, um, the toxic metabolites start to build up, um, and so now you can't take off the tourniquet because that acidic blood, or acid blood if you will, if you took off that tourniquet and allowed that blood to go back to the heart, cause cardiac arrest. Um, so a lot of times, historically, once the tourniquet comes on, if it's on there for any length of time, the only option for docs is just to amputate. <clears throat> so it fell out of favor because people were kind of using tourniquets inappropriately, and so many people were getting uh, their limbs amputated that didn't necessarily need it if they would have just applied some direct right. pressure or something else. So. Um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, um, the wars in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, they did some studies on tourniquet use and found out in certain situations it is the only thing that's going to save their life, so we should be teaching it to the lay public. Um, but with the caveat that you try everything else first. Try direct pressure, try elevating the extremity, um, try all of those things first, but if those aren't working, then you can go to a tourniquet. Um, so, how do you apply a tourniquet? Um, well, you, uh, you can use almost anything, a belt, um, any sort of um, uh, flexible device that's not too thin. Um, you wrap it around the extremity, um, you take a small stick, stick that into um, whatever you're wrapping around the extremity, and slowly twist until the bleeding stops. And it's going to probably be fairly painful for the patient um, because you are squeezing super hard. There's a lot of our art, um, arteries, you know, internally that are pretty deep. And so you do have to squeeze pretty intensely to get that to stop. But if, for instance, they've gotten their leg caught in a meat grinder or they just got blown up by an IED, that's pretty much all you can do to stop that bleeding and it will save their life. So, yes, use tourniquets. Um, but I don't think that we, uh, makes our top five because it's such a rare event that you would right. need it. Um, direct pressure is going to be what's going to stop almost all bleeding. Um, so that's why direct pressure comes in at number five on our top five list of first aid tricks. Number four on our list is temperature control. Yeah, that one seems uh, pretty obvious, right? Um, uh, aside from just the actual temperature being the problem, like if you fell into an icy lake, well, hypothermia is your problem. Right. Um, but uh, so that's not what we're talking about because everybody knows you fall into a lake, get them out of the lake, warm them up. That seems yeah. common sense. Um, and we're not even talking about uh, temperature control with someone who's standing outside in the Sahara Desert for five hours. Everybody knows they're... Um, They've just been hit in the head with a baseball bat, um, an old lady who fell in the bathroom, uh, laying on the bathroom floor. Temperature control is still exceedingly important for those people. Right. Well, it makes sense. If you think about uh, what our normal body temperature is, you know, technically it's not, but 98.6. And then you think about where people start feeling cruddy when they get fevers. It's a small, small amount that your temperature changes and already it completely changes your ability to function. So temperature control makes sense to me that, you know, that little bit of uh, adjustment in creature comforts making them comfortable is going to prevent all sorts of problems. Yeah. And actually, it's really true. Um, when it comes to metabolism in the body, they're controlled by enzymes. Enzymes are made up of protein amino acid sequences that fold um, in certain, you know, there's cascades of chemistry that happens um, between each separate enzyme, and those enzymes make all the metabolic processes inside your cells work. You need too far out of temperature range, and those enzymes start folding abnormally, and you get abnormal metabolism. And it doesn't take very far outside of a normal temperature range for that to happen, and you can start having all sorts of problems. Um, so that's why hypothermia technically is 95 degrees, anything below that, because you can start getting abnormal enzyme uh, folding um, at that temperature range. And then the colder you get, um, the less they work appropriately. Um, and for reference, um, right at somewhere around 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit, 
enzyme function ceases altogether and there isn't anything happening. So if you can get down to 68 degrees, um, there's nothing happening in your body anywhere. If there's no metabolism, you are dead. So um, somewhere between 95 and 68 degrees, you're slowly getting worse and worse and worse. And the same thing on the high end of the scales, um, somewhere around that 99 to 100 degree range, you, your enzymes start having problems. And then once you get too high, slowly you become unconscious, you start seeing seizures, things like that. One of the biggest, when it comes to, you know, temperature control, um, you know, we obviously we're talking about first aid treatments. And so, um, any idea on the percentage? If you get admitted to the hospital with a temperature between uh, uh, below 90 degrees, you have a 21% chance of surviving whatever your ordeal is. Mm -hmm. In the presence of trauma, if you get admitted with a temperature below 90 degrees, you have a near 100% chance of dying versus just 21% wow. for something else. So yeah. when it comes to trauma patients, Temperature control is huge because yeah. the colder you get, the worse off your outcome is. Um, and this is why if, if uh, we all know when we bring people to trauma centers, um, the trauma rooms, they keep them above 98 degrees for that very purpose. Right. Because what do, what do we do in first aid? We see someone that's hurt. We see an old lady laying on the ground or someone in a car wreck. We want to expose their injuries, so we're oh, ripping their clothes yeah. off, right? Yeah. Um, they're laying on a cold ground. Sometimes it's wet, and so all their all the their body heat's just you, you know conduction right. um, is coming straight out into the ground or onto the the linoleum floor. Um, they actually get cool pretty quick. Um, so we do, you know, some of our treatments to help these people is actually cooling them off. So when someone is hurt, temperature control is huge thing you can do before obviously help arrives. Um, so methods of methods of keeping them yeah warm. so yeah i mean just common sense right i mean if uh, you're gonna i mean so let's talk about we talked about number five of bleeding control mm -hmm. if someone's in a car wreck and they're squirting out their arteries well you got to expose that injury so you know where the bleeding's coming from and you can apply a direct pressure well you just took their clothes off well it might be a good idea to find some warm clothes around and then put them back on them right. um, and for someone that's just first responding like let's see the rp um reporting also, party yeah, reporting sorry. party um they can also help with the blankets if you have blankets in the car if you have a coat that you can give them because it starts immediately right. the shock sets in they're getting cold and before we even arrive so the temperature control is already diminishing before we get there and expose them even further and even if they don't seem cold right away cover them up anyway I mean, everybody knows you go to the hospital, the first thing any nurse does is throw a blanket on you. Yeah. Um, and a warm blanket usually, too. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. if they're nice, they come out of the yeah. oven. They're so nice. <laughs> I love those things. Um, so, yeah, temperature control is super huge. So if they're too hot, cool them down. Even if they have a fever, right? First aid for fevers, you know, everybody feels cold when they have a fever, so they bundle themselves up. Well, they're just making their temperature that much worse. Right. So if you do have a fever, and it's a high fever, especially kids who have exceedingly high fevers, yeah. Um, if they're up in that 102, 103 range, take all their clothes off. Stick them in a lukewarm bath, um, something to help bring that temperature back down. It's going to be uncomfortable for them, um, but it's going to actually help with their uh, keeping their body temperature in that right, right range. So when it comes to first aid, temperature control. So whatever is happening around, um, doesn't matter what the injury is, we should be focusing on their temperature. Yeah. All right, you guys might have noticed that our studio has changed a bit. We had to remove some of our furniture so that we could move on to uh, uh, point number three. You also might notice that we look like cast members from Dexter, but please bear with us. We don't have a wardrobe change or the budget to do so. So, um, Scott, number yeah. three. So number three on our uh, top five list of first aid tricks is the recovery position. Um, the reason why the recovery position is so important is because almost any type of injury that you have, um, the best position you can be in is that recovery position. It doesn't matter if it's a heart attack, a stroke, shock, um, car accident, seizure. So April's going to demonstrate our recovery position. It is going to be on their side, whichever side is not injured. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's the right side or the left side. Unless you're pregnant. <clears throat> well, unless you're pregnant, but even with that one, 
Um, you know, the idea is that uh, depending on that side, um, the arteries coming off your heart can sometimes get uh, compressed. Um, but at the end of the day, if your um, right side is injured, well, sure, then put sure. them on the left side. But if your left arm just got put through the meat grinder, do you really want to put them on the, the left side? Probably <laughs> no. not. So, bad pregnancy. <laughs> so let your situation dictate which side you put them on. But put them on their side. Um, then you're going to put the arm that's uh, closest to the ground out in front of them. So let's just assume April is unconscious, so sh her arm is out in front of her. Then you're going to take the um, leg that is on top and put it directly behind her. What that's doing for you is... <laughs> Super comfy. <laughs> <laughs> um, is if she's unconscious, that's going to keep her from rolling backwards or forwards and going to keep her on her side. The next thing you want to do is position their head so that their airway remains open. Um, in this case, we're using an AED for a pillow for April. And what that does is it keeps her neck in line. Um, you want to keep uh, the airway nice and open and in line, like uh, she's sitting straight up, only laying on her side. So if you without the pillow, obviously you could kink um, the airway just a bit. So you'll want to keep it in line. Uh, the same with her head. Don't get it too far down. Don't get it too far up. Um, we like to say it's the snooty position, that where you're kind of looking uh, out towards the tip of your nose, um, you know, looking down on someone, so to speak. <laughs> the sniffing position is what some people like to call it. And this is the recovery position. It does quite a few things for you. Um, before we get into that, April, you want to stay in that recovery position or you want to sit up now? <laughs> um, so the recovery position does a few things for you. Um, the first thing is um, it's less work on your heart to get blood flow to the brain. Um, obviously, when you're injured, uh, the biggest thing uh, people are concerned about is um, can you maintain perfusion to your brain? Um, and when you're sitting up, your heart has to fight against gravity. Uh, depending on which study you read, um, it has to work about 20 to 30 percent harder when you're sitting up than when you're laying down. So you lay them down, it's, uh, you know, it's working less hard, mm -hmm. um, needs less oxygen to, um, because it doesn't have to work so hard. Um, the other things it's going to be doing for you is if someone's unconscious, if they're laying on their back, uh, their tongue is a muscle, it'll be relaxed and it will actually occlude their airway. So if you lay them on their side, it keeps the tongue from uh, occluding the airway. Um, the other thing it can do for you is if uh, someone's nauseous. When you get injured, you get nauseous um, and you vomit. If you're laying on your back and breathing, you'll breathe that right into your lungs and no one wants to drown in their own puke. So. Um, if you have them on their side, gravity will be your friend and the vomit will just come right out onto the ground. So since we're talking about the recovery position, Scott, is this a good spot to talk about seizures? Because I feel like there's a lot of uh, misinformation or misunderstandings in how to treat somebody who's having, having a seizure or had a seizure. So um, my understanding is the recovery position also works well for a seizure patient. It does. And um, just like uh, we've talked about, it works for any type of injury. Seizures is one of those things that cause someone to become unconscious. Um, so if they're having a seizure, um, you do want to put them in that recovery position um, and, and kind of protect them from, you know, hurting themselves. Someone in the seizure, sometimes uh, seizures will have uh, tonic-clonic movements. Um, and if they're around sharp objects or their heads against the concrete ground and they're smashing their head against the ground, mm -hmm. you know, that's a bad thing. So <laughs> protect them the best you can in that recovery position to pad around them. And, and not forcing them into the recovery position. I think that's important to understand too, that we're not saying to hold them down and make sure they stay in this exact position because they will fight you on it. Oh, exactly. You know, so um, They are, those tonic-clonic <laughs> movements are, they are super rigid, so don't try and force somebody in any position they can. If you cannot get their leg and their arm out, then don't put it out, don't right. force them. Um, but do the best you can to keep them on their side and pad around them. Uh, the other thing that's important to talk about with seizures is don't put a bite block in their mouth. Don't try to shove anything in their mouth to try and keep their uh, them from biting their tongue. I think uh, it's kind of uh, in the movies and uh, you know and on TV quite a bit. Uh, dramatized. <laughs> dramatized yeah. that when someone's having a seizure, quick, get my wallet, stick it in their mouth, or get this stick and stick it in their mouth. <laughs> right. Um, uh, that's bad. Don't ever do that. 
Um, some of the reasons why is because someone's having a seizure, they are super clenched down. Um, they're biting pretty darn hard um, and trying to force their mouth open um, might actually cause damage. You might actually break their tooth off. Yeah, far more trauma is likely, I think, with forcing mm -hmm. that movement than letting them. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and, and you can break someone's tooth off trying to force that mouth open and stick something in there. Someone who's having a seizure, their entire body um, is moving. All of their muscle groups are engaged. It's like running on a treadmill you can't get off of. So they're breathing super deep and super fast. And if you cause anything, you, you know, any broken tooth, well, they're going to breathe that in and aspirate it. Now you've just made the problem worse. Right. Um, the other problem is uh, trying to force somebody's mouth open, <laughs> stick your finger in there, they're going to bite it off. Right. And now your finger is going to get aspirated into their lungs, and now you're not going to be able to retrieve it in them to be able to attach it again. So probably don't want to so stick gross. your fingers in your mouth. <laughs> Stay away from the mouth. <clears throat> yeah. No one wants to drown on someone else's finger. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Or choke on someone yeah. else's finger. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> what did he choke on? He Bob's thumb. He didn't die from the seizure, but he did choke on his buddy's finger. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, do not stick some anything in someone's mouth who's having a seizure. Will they bite their tongue? Maybe. Will they bite a portion of their tongue off? Maybe. Yeah. Um, but you trying to s prevent that from happening is going to be far more dangerous than a bloody tongue. Um, and if you have them in the recovery position, any blood that's coming from that tongue is going to drain out onto the ground, which Either. is what we want, just like the vomit. Um, so good point about the seizures. Yeah. All right. We're going to move right into number two. And actually, it's going to combine a little bit with number one, but we're going to start out with what our number uh, two um, topic here is, and it's CPR. Um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, it's not new. It's been around for a long, long time, and it just seems like it kind of evolves all the time, kind of like what we talked about before, like bell bottoms. You know, they, <laughs> they keep kind of adjusting them, but the idea is still the same. So um, we're going to talk about uh, why it works. How does it work? Exactly, and the science is changing pretty dramatically, pretty quickly. Uh, resuscitation science in general is fairly new. Um, so the studies on resuscitation um, are coming back now and we're changing how we do CPR. Um, in the past, people, you know, probably heard things like you do 15 compressions to two breaths. Um, you've got to, you know, check for pulses and things like that. Different um, numbers for different rescuers and... Oh, exactly. Yeah. Um, and resuscitation science has come around to say, you yeah, that's probably not the right way to go. Um, and I like the fact that you mentioned we're going to kind of bring in number two of uh, CPR and mold it in with our top number one first aid trick, which is uh, AED use, uh, shocking someone. Um, and the reason that is is because if someone's in cardiac arrest, you need both. Um, so, you know, is AED better than CPR? Um, you could make that argument. Um, you can make the argument that CPR use is more important than AED. So we're just going to say the yin and the yang um, of AED use and CPR of number one and number two um, is is pretty much the most important first aid trick anyone should know. Peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. Peanut yeah. butter and yeah. jelly. That's <laughs> way better than yin and yang. <laughs> they can go by themselves, but it's not the same. It's as not them the same. <laughs> so let's talk about first why CPR. Um, it, in the United States alone, about 380,000 people every year have a cardiac arrest outside of the hospital. CPR is so easy now, um, you almost don't even need a full class. I was going to say, I had an uh, 80-year-old woman who had never taken a CPR class, whose husband went into cardiac arrest, and she called 911 in about 15 to 20 seconds of coaching from the uh, dispatcher, she was able to initiate CPR, and her husband actually um, survived that event. It's, it's a super easy skill. All we really need to know how to do is compressions. What studies have found is that the, the thing that matters the most in CPR is compressions and compressions alone. And if you stop compressions for anything, including breathing, their chance of survival goes through the floor. Yeah. Um, and drops off dramatically. Um, and the reason why that is, is your body needs a blood pressure, right? You need to have pressure to put blood to your brain. Um, what resuscitation science is finding is that compressions, it takes about 10 compressions to build up enough pressure to get blood to your brain. So, um, you know, we can see the old way of doing 15 compressions to two breaths. 
Well, it takes 10 to get enough blood flow to the brain to so begin just with. Getting proficient. You're just getting there, and yeah. then you stop to breathe, and now it goes back to zero again. So two-thirds of the time, it was doing nothing, and only one-third of the time was it helping. What studies also found, um, the reason why checking for pulses is out, because they found lay people took up to t uh, two minutes read that. to oh, check for a pulse. That's an incredible amount of time. And that yeah. is an incredible amount of time, wow. because um, the second you go into cardiac arrest, um, Every minute you go without doing compressions, their chance of survival reduces by 10%. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking two minutes to check for a pulse, they just lost 20% um, of their chance of surviving. So Well, I wonder how much of that two minutes was people delaying too because they were afraid. Because I, I feel like there was a big campaign about not doing it perfectly. And I think people thought they were going to injure the person. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like a lot of civilians that are forced into situations, even with family members, their fear is that they shouldn't start CPR. And so I feel like that two minutes is them going, oh, come on, i got to find a pulse. Oh, or, yeah. oh, you know, and they're not wanting to start, you know, so they're finding reasons to not. And I feel like that two minutes is them delaying. Well, it is, and they're just trying to... Are, do they really not have a pulse? Right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to hurt them. You're, yeah. you know, adrenaline, and you're shaky, and you're you're looking yeah, for something it's your that's loved not, one, yeah. for goodness sakes. Right. You know, it just takes a long time, and and so what all the studies are saying is, look, breathing's not really that important right away. Checking for pulses is not that important right away. What is important is, are they unconscious? And so we do need to make sure that they're unconscious. So we need to shake them, shout at them, whatever you do to, to you know, determine if they truly are unconscious. Um, and if they are, um, well, then the next thing you need to do is, are they breathing normally? Well, what is that? What's breathing normally? I'm going to recommend the creepiest thing you've ever seen and watch your spouse breathe when they're sleeping. That's what breathing normally looks like. Watch somebody breathe when they're sitting in a chair. <laughs> kind of creepy. It's <laughs> so creepy. But that's what it looks right, like, right? right? It is a rhythmic in and out. It's about the same amount of expiration as in inspiration. It's rhythmic, sometimes faster and slower, but it's still rhythmic. Right. Um, if it's not normal, you can see it's not normal. They have fancy names for all of it, like Kussmaul respirations and agonal respirations. But at the end of the day, all of that doesn't matter because it's all abnormal. Agonal respirations is going to be weird ins and outs, and they're not rhythmic at all. Right. Kussmaul is going to be huge in and out, and, and it's just not normal. And so all they found is if they are unconscious, unresponsive, and they're not breathing normally, start CPR. Mm -hmm. Don't need to do anything else. So you can do that in about three seconds. Walk up, shake them. Hey, are you awake? If they're not... Are they breathing on me? No. Perfect. I'm going to start compressions. Shook them. Hey. We've, they're not awake. They're not breathing normally. The next thing you want to do is actually expose the chest however you can. Um, this is not uh, a modest event, so if you're worried about exposing someone's breasts or their chest, don't be. Because They'll thank gonna, you later. Yeah. They but, will. Well, can I interject something here, too? I've, I've had situations where there have been events uh, in uh, cold weather, Pacific Northwest, and people have three or four layers, and people have gotten hung up on trying to expose the chest because they've been in classes where they say expose the chest. So if for some reason it's not reasonable to do so quickly, don't spend a lot of time because you can still find you know, your True. location and, and do good CPR without completely removing the clothes. So I say do it if you can, do it quickly, um, but don't let it delay you that long. Yeah, if it's going to take you five minutes to take off their clothes, well, you just reduce their chance of survival <laughs> by 50%. So try and find your landmark. There was right? a YouTube video where somebody was struggling like with a North Face and unzipping it, and the people were fighting, trying to get their arms out of sleeves oh, and stuff like goodness. that. And I was like, someone just, it was a, you know, a couple layers like this, where it was like, you could still, look at me, I was like, yeah. <laughs> you could still, you know, get in there and do good CPR over what April's wearing. Yeah. So uh, the key is also the placement. So do the best you can to place your hands in the right spot with the clothes on. And it's a lot more difficult with clothes on, which is why we want to try and expose the chest if you can. Right. So um, the best spot for uh, compressions is going to be the mid-sternum. So where's your sternum? Everybody's got a sternal notch, and you can kind of feel along um, your clavicles here, and in the middle is a nice little notch. You can feel it with your finger. Everyone has one. doesn't matter how big or small. Um, it's pretty simple to feel. Um, the second part of your, the bottom part of your sternum is called your xiphoid process, and that is right at the portion where your ribs come up and your ribs meet. You put your finger on the sternal notch, 
your finger right where your ribs meet at your xiphoid process, and there's your sternum. You want to be right in the middle of there, right in the middle of the sternum. And the reason that is, is the heart is right below there. The heart is at, and what we're trying to do with compressions is to compress the heart. We, there are, the heart is two parts. It's a mechanical part and an electrical part. The compressions is taking care of the mechanical part, the squeeze part. And so what we're trying to do is squeeze the heart between your sternum and your spine. And you do that by going mid-sternum and you need to push. And you need to push about one-third the width of their body. Um, you've probably heard in the past um, things like two and a half inches for adults, an inch for children. Um, I don't know. Do you guys carry tape measure with you? <laughs> no. Yeah, well, and I think that's so silly because yeah. you'll see a very slight, slender, full-grown adult, and they're built like this this uh, mannequin. And then you'll see a big barrel-chested guy whose chest depth is two or three times that. And you can't use that number for all adults. And... Yeah, it doesn't really work. Now, now the, the big uh, resuscitation... Um, organizations of the country still have, uh, you know, specific ranges of two and a half inches for adult and things like that. But this is practical knowledge, right? Today I found out once, give us a practical, what's going to work for you? What's going to work is one third the width of their body. Now in doing so, what's going to happen? You're going to break hit, ribs. Yeah. You're going to break cartilage, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's going to sound like your ribs are breaking. Um, uh, it's going to feel like their ribs are breaking. But what's happening is where your ribs attached to your sternum is attached with cartilage. And what you want to do is break that cartilage, and you want that to happen because there is no way you're going to be able to compress right. one-third the width of their body what unless you break that cartilage. Mm -hmm. So if you're not feeling that cartilage break, you might want to push a little harder. Yeah. Um, you want to feel that. And it's going to feel gross. It It does. It's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, just keep going. It does. And it usually stops after a few yeah. pushes. Yes. Once so. you've broken it all off, you won't feel it anymore. Yeah. Um, but you do need to push that hard. Um, and then you also want to come all the way back up when you're done. Because like I said, we are squeezing on the heart to force blood out. We're taking over that mechanical squeeze of the heart. So if you are pushing all the way down and then you don't come all the way back up, the blood is not going to fill up the heart all of the way so that the next compression isn't going to squirt out as much blood as it normally would. So while it's just as important to go down one-third the width, it's also just as important to come up all the way. Right. And you'll want to do that and it, pretty fast. Right, 100, 100, 100 beats a minute? At yeah. least 100 a minute, yeah. exactly. Um, so obviously, percentage-wise, this is going to happen on someone in your family. Are you going to remember... Uh, one third the width. Are you going to remember that? No. Probably not. You're going to be, uh, you know, excited. You're going to be amped. You're going to be talking on the phone to 911. All you need to remember is push hard and push fast. If you're doing it correctly, it's going to be work. You're going to be working hard. Um, it is a CrossFit workout from the Navy SEALs. I mean, <laughs> it is, it's an intense thing. Um, and you know, studies are saying it doesn't matter how big and strong you are, after two minutes, your ability to do good compressions goes down dramatically. Um, and to be on that point, uh, when it comes to resuscitations by paramedics and firefighters and doctors, we don't allow people to do compressions for longer than two minutes. We are switching out every two minutes because of that fact. Right. So if you are doing compressions on someone, Let's be honest, it's going to take longer than two minutes for the fire department or whoever else is around to get there. Um, so uh, if there's somebody else around you, switch out. Tell them how to do compressions. Switch out every two minutes so you're getting that break. Right. Um, but sometimes it's not. We've all seen family members who unfortunately have had to do CPR for 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, and they are Exhausting. spent. Yeah. They are sweating profusely. If you're doing it right, it's going to be a workout. So expect that. So let's do some examples of really good CPR. We're going to have April do this because she is what we like to call a metronome. Um, in our profession, I have seen April do CPR on countless people. She is a metronome. Uh, she is fantastic at it. So we're going to have her show you. How to... Put that on your resume. Yeah. <laughs> really good at CPR. No pressure, April. <laughs> hey, Miss Smith. Nope. Expose the chest. Find the center of the sternum and start CPR. Now, while April's pushing here for about two minutes, 
um, I'd like to bring up that there's a nice fancy song that's kind of uh, apropos for this sort of thing called Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. If you don't know how, how fast 100 beats a minute is, just sing the song Staying Alive and do compressions to every beat, and you will be uh, doing it about 100 times a minute. I've heard that uh, another one bites the dust. I sing does that the one. Same thing. Another one bites so, the dust, you know, so yeah. Maybe not quite as catchy in the event that you're doing CPR, but... Not quite as optimistic either. I mean, Staying Alive <laughs> is optimistic. Let's get this done. Uh, you know, another one bites the dust is... Not so much. All right, and since we're talking about CPR, Scott, should we go ahead and roll into our number one, which is the AED, the Automated External Defibrillator? Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Ding! <laughs> um, we talked about the, the hearts as two parts, right? It's a mechanical squeeze that, we're, that we are taking over with CPR compressions, um, and then it's also one part electrical. Um, in the normal heart, um, the electrical system is what causes the squeeze. It is true that the heart is actually shocking itself 60 to 100 times a minute on average. Um, how it's doing that um, uses electrolytes. Um, yay Gatorade, right? Um, it's using electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium. Um, in the top right portion of your heart, there's a little grouping of cells called your sinoatrial node. Um, that sinoatrial node and those little grouping of cells automatically, they have what's called automaticity, um, creates an electrical beat by exchanging those electrolytes. Um, well, just the starting point will say that uh, inside the cell membrane or inside the cell is potassium. The cell membrane uh, creates the barrier. Um, outside the cell is sodium and calcium. Sodium will start coming into the cell. Potassium will start going out of the cell. Once uh, the electrical differential between intra and extracellularly gets to uh, uh, the right point, it'll open up calcium channels and then calcium will rush into that cell and that will create an electrical different, uh, the differential of elect the electrical differential um, to the point where it will discharge that shock right down the heart. Um, it starts by going across the top two chambers, which are atria. There's another little grouping of cells called your atrioventricular node. Um, that electrical beat gets kind of held up a little bit in that AV node, and that allows the blood to go from the top part of your heart to the bottom part. Um, then it gets discharged down the bottom parts of your heart, which are your ventricles. And then those ventricles push that out into your body, and that's how your heartbeat is created. Um, so what we're doing um, in cardiac arrest, what happens is your sinoatrial node isn't working normally. So when that's not working normally, there's lots of other portions of your heart, uh, pretty much every heart cell, um, they call them foci, um, can create that same electrical differential. And if the SA node isn't working, all those other foci start working or trying to work to create that bead as well. And what you get is what's called ventricular fibrillation and your heart just starts quivering like it's bacon frying in a pan. Um, and you're not actually getting any blood movement. Um, a ventricular fibrillation is the most common uh, cardiac rhythm um, in cardiac arrest. Um, another one's called ventricular tachycardia. Uh, same thing's happening. Your ventricles are going so fast, not enough blood's being able to be pushed out. And those are the two most common. And so what uh, the engineers of the world have found is that, well, if all that's happening, we need to stop all those extra foci from creating the electrical differential because we want the SA node to do that. So what did they do? They created a way to shock the crap out of your heart and discharge all that electricity. They are basically stopping the electricity in the heart. They're not starting anything, they're stopping it all. Um, so a point about that being, um, we see that electrical activity of the heart on an EKG, right? Um, and you've probably seen in the movies where they have flat line and somebody shocks them. Well, if you have flat line, you have no electrical movement at all. So it's already stopped. So we're not going to shock that. So if you see them shocking flat line on TV, know that they'll probably use, lose their medical license if they're a real doctor later because they're really just burning the heart at that point. Um, we do actually need to see electrical movement, and we're going to stop it with the electricity. Um, the um, engineers of the world have found out um, that we can do that and make a machine that anyone can shock the heart if it needs to be shocked in cardiac arrest. And the reason for that is the longer you go without blood, 
to the brain, the worse your chance of survival. And like we've talked about before, after about 10 minutes, you've almost got 0% chance that your brain cells are going to survive. And let's be honest, if you called 911 after someone goes into cardiac arrest, it's probably going to take longer than 10 minutes for them to get there. Um, so we probably want to have a way to help shock the heart before they get there. And we've come up with that way by uh, automatic external defibrillators. And what they've done is they've trained these machines to look for those two lethal heart rhythms we talked about, ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. If it sees that, it will allow you to shock it. If it doesn't see that, it won't allow you to shock it. Um, so um, that's the electrical system of the heart. So we do need the mechanicals of the CPR compressions, but compressions will not start the heart again. So if you see them on TV and they're doing compressions and magically they come alive, eh, they probably weren't in cardiac arrest. <laughs> Jen, if you want to talk about the AED and sure. how it works. Um, the AED itself is very, very simplistic. Just like Scott said, it's basically just a method to deliver a shock to the heart. Um, there's many different manufacturers. There's uh, different, uh, you know, I shouldn't say quality, but you know, prices go up just depending on uh, the, the, the model that you're getting. So there's one that are going to be used more frequently and professionals are going to have them. They're going to be more expensive, but you can actually have a model in your home for around $1,000. So um, a lot of the uh, public buildings are schools. Um, you're finding AEDs popping up everywhere. In fact, they even have apps where you can uh, load this app up on your phone and it shows you in, in, you know, in the need of an emergency, you can hit the app, it'll show you where the closest one is. And that seems kind of silly, but if you think about it, just, you know, being in a uh, city or a town where there might be one on the same street as you taking a minute or two to grab it, would be well worth uh, the time invested to um, help this person's survivability increase. So um, the AED themselves are all pretty much the same thing. They just look different and have different colors. So opening it up here, um, most uh, AEDs are um, will have separate pads. There are some models, like the one we have here, that are actually uh, connected to it. So it, it actually makes it a little bit quicker on this model here, opening it up and ha accessing that. And I'll demo that in a minute. Um, if you'll notice, there's only a couple buttons on an AED. They're pretty simple to use, and uh, most are just like this. You'll see there's one on and off button. It's usually green. And then there's a orange button with a little lightning bolt. So that's pretty uh, self-explanatory what that button's for. That's the um, one that it's going to do the shocking. That's huh? right. If you don't, uh, you don't feel comfortable initially. There's almost always really, really simplistic instructions on the outside. Very few people have it with them to uh, read that. And quite honestly, just turning on the machine is going to be ninety percent of the battle. So once you've turned it on, it's going to walk you through the whole process. Um, I actually think we should just do that and demo how simple it is to use them, rather than go over the specifics. On we can kind of talk about some of the finer points once we're done. Well, and I think as a good point you just mentioned turning on the machine, it'll tell you what to do. Um, they're they're uh, already pre-programmed. It'll walk you through the process. Right. Um, so really, all you have to do is know how to turn it on, and it'll tell you what to do. Yeah, I think a couple things that are always important to understand with the AEDs, though, um, they need to be uh, placed, the pads need to be placed on bare skin. Uh, most likely or most uh, appropriately would be not super wet. So it's not always, uh, you know, an ability to have them completely dry just because they're diaphoretic from... Um, having a cardiac event and or drowning, stuff like that, but try to dry them off real briefly. Um, and then the placement's pretty important. So we have shook and shout, the person is unconscious, <laughs> they are not breathing normally, so we're gonna go right to compressions. All right. And as April's doing the compressions, Jen's got her AED, she's going to break it out, and all she's gonna do is turn it on. Begin by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. Cut clothing if needed. So you probably heard, it tells you, take the clothes off, cut them off if you need to. So we do that. When patient's chest is bare, remove protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. So now it just told you, now that the patient's bare, take out Look the pads. Look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pads. Peel one pad from the yellow plastic liner. So it's telling you there's a picture on the Place pads. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. So it shows you on the picture where to put it. That's all you have to do is put it where the when picture says. When the first says. pad is in place, look 
carefully at the picture on the second pad. Peel the second pad from the yellow plastic liner. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. Now I'm going to shut off this particular AED because these AEDs are really technologically Make sure advanced. That the yellow plastic <laughs> liner is more so than you are. More so than me. It actually is going to be able to sense whether you've put the pads on or not. And if it you haven't, it's just going to keep telling you to do that until you do. So you'll either do it because it's telling you to, or you'll do it so that it'll stop talking to you because it's just going to keep saying the same thing. And if you'll notice, uh, the um, the repeating of the information gets more and more rapid as they feel like you're failing and not getting the job done. <laughs> so it's starting to yell at you at that point. That's right. <laughs> Just they, get it done. The AEDs are also capable of knowing when, so when you have completed a task, you don't have to wait for the prompt. So if a person's been through training, I didn't have to wait for them to tell me to open it up. And if you just jump right in and stick them on, the machine will catch up to wherever stage you're at, and it'll actually initiate the care based on your your process. So if you're someone that's used to using them, the machine actually goes much quicker than what we did. And once you put the pads on and once it's sensed that it's there, the machine will say, stop CPR, do not touch the patient. When it says that, it's sensing the heart rhythm. If it senses that ventricular fibrillation or that ventricular tachycardia, it will then say, shock advised, do not touch the patient. Obviously, they don't want you touching the patient because they don't want you getting shocked. Mm -hmm. So you just don't touch the patient. You do what it says. The machine will charge itself up. You will hear it charging itself up. As soon as it's charged, it'll say, shock the patient. Uh, press the flashing orange light. So the orange light will start flash, or the orange button will start flashing. You press it, it will shock the patient. Then the machine will say, start CPR. And so you'll go right back to starting CPR. And it will keep doing that over and over again until help arrives. Every couple of minutes, the machine is going to say stop CPR again so it can check the heart rhythm. So every few minutes, you'll stop CPR so that the machine can check. And if it doesn't sense it because the, the person's heart started beating or the rhythm that's being produced by the heart isn't one of those two, it'll just tell you to start CPR again, in which then you'll note, are they unconscious? And are they not breathing normally? Then start CPR again. So between the mechanical squeeze of compressions and the electrical shock of the AED, combined this peanut butter and jelly of first aid tricks is our number one and number two first aid tricks you should know. And the reason why is they will have a 100% chance of dying if you do nothing. If you do this, this is their only chance to survive. So thanks for tuning in today. Uh, thank you to Today I Found Out for teaming up with us for the, the top five first aid tricks everyone should know. Um, they are, once again, direct pressure, uh, temperature control, recovery position, CPR, and AED use. If Do not take this as your first aid or CPR class, please. <laughs> um, if you would like to know more, we do recommend please go take a first aid and CPR class. If you liked what you saw today, please check out our website or our YouTube channel. Medicalconfessions.com <laughs>